to From Care to Cure, an educational webinar series presented by the Massachusetts General Hospital Frontal Temporal Disorders Unit. My name is Katie Brandt, and I'm the Director of Caregiver Support Services and Public Relations for the MGH FTD Unit. It's my happy role to coordinate educational opportunities for our community of persons living with a diagnosis, care partners, and healthcare professionals that can improve the understanding, care, and treatment of frontal temporal dementia, atypical Alzheimer's disease, and related conditions. From Care to Cure aims to empower families and our community members with knowledge and information presented by our expert team of staff and clinicians. Today's presentation will be given by Megan Quimby and Daisy Hochberg and provide an overview of primary progressive aphasia, a condition that is an area of expertise for our clinical research program. Megan Quimby is the director of the speech and language program at the MGH Frontal Temporal Disorders Unit. Megan is a clinically certified speech language pathologist and has a master of science degree in speech language pathology. Megan specializes in working with individuals with progressive language disorders. In the past, Megan has worked at an adult day health program, the MGH Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and at Constant Therapy. She's focused on research for primary progressive aphasia and runs our MGH FTD unit speech language pathology training program, educating the next generation of speech language pathologists to have expertise in FTD, as well as the specialized support required for individuals living with primary progressive aphasia. Daisy Hochberg is a founding speech and language pathologist in the MGH FTD unit, launching the PPA program with Dr. Brad Dickerson in 2007. She focuses on the evaluation and monitoring of language symptoms in patients with primary progressive aphasia and has a research and clinical focus on frontal temporal dementia, primary progressive aphasia, speech and language therapy, as well as assessment and monitoring techniques for individuals living with FTD and PPA. It is my honor to turn the program over to Megan and Daisy for the next episode in our 2021 From Care to Cure educational series, Understanding Primary Progressive Aphasia. Hello, welcome to our program today on understanding primary progressive aphasia, known as PPA. My name is Daisy Hochberg, and I'm a speech and language pathologist in the MGH FTD unit. Today, I'll be talking about PPA, reviewing the three main subtypes, as well as describing our evaluation process. And then Megan Quimby, the director of the speech and language program in our unit, will be talking about our approach to treatment. To begin, I'll discuss what PPA is. It's an acquired language disorder, which is known as an aphasia. An aphasia can have many different causes, including stroke or brain injury. In the case of PPA, the language problem is caused by changes in the brain. The problem gets worse over time, or is progressive, and is the most prominent problem that the person experiences at least for the first two years. People with other diagnoses, such as Alzheimer's or behavioral variant FTD, often do experience communication problems and problems with their speech and language, but their most prominent problem is in another area, such as memory or behavior. So frontotemporal dementia, known as FTD, is an umbrella term for PPA as well as the behavioral variant of FTD. And then under the category of PPA, there are three main subtypes, the non-fluent agrammatic subtype, the semantic subtype, and the logopenic subtype. And it's important to note that not everyone fits neatly into one of these three subtypes. Therefore, we like to focus on learning about the characteristics of an individual person's speech and language abilities 
as opposed to relying on classifying someone into one of the subtypes. So I will be playing some audio and video clips of people with these variants, and they'll be describing this picture known as the picnic scene in our unit. So it may be helpful for you to keep this picture in mind as you listen to our samples. The first variant we'll be discussing is the non-fluent agrammatic variant. So the main impairment that characterizes this subtype is called agrammatism. So what this means is that the person might have trouble putting words together into grammatical sentences and using those small helping words of language, such as the or a or other small words. Um, they may also have some difficulty understanding grammatically complex sentences. And they may do better in general with simple, uh, shorter sentences and phrases. Um, and they may have something called effortful or halting speech, which is often due to a difficulty in pronouncing or articulating the sounds of words. There are different ways of characterizing these types of difficulties, including apraxia of speech and dysarthria. And while I have just described some of the main problems that a person with this type of PPA may have, it is also so important to describe their areas of strength. So in this subtype, a person's understanding of the meanings of words is generally intact, as well as other domains of language. Um, though the person may have difficulty coming up with a word they wanna use, they generally know what words mean. So here's a sample um, of a person with this type of, um, with a subtype describing that picture I just showed you. Let's take a listen. Bull, um, bull flying a kite, boy by flying a kite and um, garage, uh, car garage, parked in the garage. Okay, so this person had some difficulty pronouncing some of the sounds and said mainly simple sentences and short phrases and left out some of those smaller helping words of language. So now we're gonna play a video of a different person with the same subtype of PPA, having a conversation with the clinician. So let's listen to and watch. Waiting my gunny yesterday. Was waiting my gunny. Waiting, can you write it down for me? Waiting, weeding her yes. garden. Oh, yes. weeding your garden, I'm sorry. Uh, Lozy, get AC. You're brave keeping the garden. When yes, have yes, yes. Like that. Wow, that's amazing. So the AC um, makes me congested. Can you say the full word for AC? Air condition. Okay. Air condition. Good, good. <laughs> so, so this person had particular difficulty pronouncing the longer words, such as air conditioning, and also had some trouble pronouncing the vowel sound in the word weeding. Um, and these are some common features of this subtype. And she also used mainly shorter sentences. So now we'll discuss the semantic subtype of PPA. So unlike the agrammatic non-fluent subtype that we just discussed, um, speech in um, patients with this type of PPA is often fluent and grammatical, but they have trouble coming up with the word they want in order to give meaning to what they're saying. They may have anomia or trouble putting a name to an item or they may no longer know the features of the item itself. So this difficulty results often in vague or empty qualities to the speech. Um, they may also not recognize certain words that they used to know. And here is a sample of a person with the subtype uh, describing that picnic scene. 
So they're sitting right there. She's playing something with it for maybe some water or something. Um, he's reading an item. So his speech was fluent and articulate. He did not have difficulty pronouncing words at all. And he spoke grammatically, um, but his speech lacked some of the content words. So his um, speech sample was a little more vague. And here's a video um, of a person with this type of PPA doing a task where she um, listens to the clinician say a word and she's asked to point to that item. Um, there are 10 pictures on the paper all belonging to the same category. So for example, tools or birds or fruits and she's asked to point to one of those items. And this task is to get a sense as to whether the person knows the meaning of the word without actually having to say the word. So the person can just point, they can just recognize the word and match it to a picture. So let's, let's watch this clip. I don't know what flyers are. Is this a flyer? Yeah, what kind of animal are we gonna look at now? Squirrel. Squirrel. Okay, it's official, I don't know. Try guessing. I'll guess this is a squirrel. I don't so know. she pointed to the cat instead of the squirrel. What about the camel? Camel. I want to say this is a camel. But I don't and that's the it. giraffe she pointed to instead of the camel. Peacock. Peacock. I don't know what a peacock is. Try guessing. I'll guess this one. So she pointed to the eagle there. And when she was asked to point to the peacock, and this demonstrates her difficulty understanding the meanings of words. And interestingly, this problem sometimes tends to be worse for living or natural items as opposed to man-made or non-living items or objects. So the third subtype we will discuss is the logopenic subtype. People with this subtype have difficulty with word finding. However, their knowledge of the meaning of the word is intact. The problem is in coming up with the word. The speech with this subtype is characterized by what's called variably fluent speech. So sometimes the person can speak um, in fluent runs, um, fluent stretches of speech, but at other times there are pauses to search for the right word. There is difficulty with repeating longer words and sentences due to a problem in what's called the auditory verbal working memory. And this is the part of your mind that keeps information in your mind long enough to do something with it, to process it. For example, to hold a sentence in your mind long enough to you, for you to repeat the whole thing. So here's a sample of a patient with this variant of PPA describing that picnic scene. When I and a wife are sitting in a kip, I um, having a pip, uh, kip, what do you do? You have things there, and the kids are all playing out there, and they live over there, and it's a, a kip pick, not picnic um, over here. Um, they may also be the people who own the boat there too. So this person had difficulty coming up with some of the words he wanted as well as pronouncing some of the sounds of the words correctly. Um, so an example of that is saying clate for plate, for example. And this kind of error is called a phonemic paraphasic error. So let's listen to this video um, where this uh, patient is doing a repetition task. 62 and a half. 62 and a half. Perfect. The pastry cook was satisfied. The, can you give me the, I just, mm -hmm. the, the. The pastry cook, cook was oh, satisfied. Pastry. Oh. What, it's the, what was the. No, I'm not getting it. I'm oh. sorry. So um, she was able to repeat some of those shorter phrases, but when given a longer sentence, she had difficulty with that likely due to a problem holding the words in her mind long enough to repeat them. 
So now I'm going to briefly discuss how we approach um, evaluating people with PPA. So we spend a lot of time with people who come into our clinic or our research facility so that we can really understand what's happening in the person's daily life, what kind of symptoms or speech and language difficulties they're having, um, as well as what is working well for them and what their strengths are. And we like to have a discussion with the patient, him or herself, as well as with um, someone who knows them well, to really get an idea of, of what's going on in daily life. And we also conduct uh, several structured speech and language uh, tasks so that we can see how the person is doing on, on structured language assessment. We think it's really important to put together these two sources of information to get a full picture of how the patient is functioning. Um, to uh, better achieve that, we developed the progressive aphasia severity scale, known as the PASS, um, which is a system of rating impairment uh, in a variety of language domains. And this uses clinician judgment as well as information about the patient's um, daily life, as well as how they're doing on language testing. And the clinician incorporates all these sources of information to make their rating. So our, our goal with this scale is to use it to monitor if a, a patient is stable or progressing in their difficulties in certain domains while, while looking at other domains that may be stable or intact and how um, to look at how things are changing or staying the same over time. And we're happy that this scale is now being used at centers globally. And this provides a, a common structured tool for clinicians and researchers to use around the world. So before I turn it over to Megan, um, just a quick note about how we've carried out our assessments during the COVID-19 pandemic that we've all been experiencing over the last year or so. So um, our team has worked together to develop modified tasks to facilitate remote administration, um, which we do for clinical and research purposes. And we often are able to um, conduct a very comprehensive assessment with um, patients and do interviews with their um, care partner over Zoom. And we found that it's been working really well. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Megan Quimby who will discuss our approach to speech language therapy. Hello, my name is Megan Quimby and I'm the director of the speech and language program at the MGH FTD unit. Since Daisy Hochberg talked so much about assessment and evaluation in primary progressive aphasia, I'll be talking a little bit about treatment. Treatment and PPA or primary progressive aphasia is different than you would see if someone has an aphasia or a language impairment from a stroke. It is primarily focused on compensatory strategies since the disease will progress over time. Therefore, um, it's more about talking around words if you have word finding difficulty or compensating for some of the language impairment he or she may have. Therefore, working with a caregiver is really important because it's not only the patient who is adjusting to a new communication style, it's the caregiver or loved one as well. Personalized treatment is really important. Um, patients with, with um, have a variety of different goals, a variety of different symptoms. So personalizing the treatment to that person and the family is very important. Support groups are really important as well, both for the patient as well as the caregivers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, as well as community resources. We're here and it's also really important that you have health professionals nearby um, and loved ones and different resources nearby and locally to help you and assist you. The goal of treatment is really functional communication. And what I mean by that is getting a message across in the best way you can. It doesn't have to be in the perfect way. It doesn't have to be the exact words that you want to use. It's really just to communicate your feelings and your wishes in the best way you can. And participation in daily activities is also another goal. Um, so the person with the diagnosis can be as independent as they can in, in daily life. 
So treatment goals are really based on a patient's symptoms and severity. Um, uh, you would treat a patient in the very mild stage, very different than if they were in the severe stage. For instance, in the severe stage, the focus rather than being with the patient goes more to the caregiver so they can adapt to different behaviors or different difficulties and language impairments that the patient is having at the severe stage rather than the mild stage. Um, we really try to have treatment begin in the mild or very mild stages. That's because you can prepare and be educated on what is to come in, in the, the different stages, as well as patients normally have more insight in the beginning stages of the disease than in the later stages. It's really important that the goals are functional, achievable, and realistic. So in the beginning, the family and the patient will work with the clinician and express what is important to them and what is not. And the clinician will make sure that those are achievable based on what they know about primary progressive aphasia and what they know about the patient and the family. Communication goals center around the needs and feelings of the patient. So making sure that the patient can communicate what they need and what they want and how they're feeling in the best way they can. And memory and executive functioning goals really um, focus on uh, daily participation in life, um, independence when it's possible. And I'll get in, into that a little bit more later in the presentation. For speech language therapy, um, like I said before, the goal is really enhancing functional communication. There's more ways to communicate than in words. So for instance, if your loved one is having difficulty finding the correct words or even articulating words, there's a lot of different ways to communicate. For instance, facial expressions can communicate a lot, gestures, writing, there are several different ways. Um, and it's important that you adapt communication to the co course of the disease. Like I said earlier, it will look a little different in mild stages versus moderate and severe stages. Recommend, recommendations for speech and language therapy. Um, it's really important that you are um, having the treatment with an experienced speech language pathologist and primary progressive aphasia. Since it is a rare condition, um, that's not all speech language pathologists have experience with, um, with the diagnosis. And therefore our, our research team and our clinic team um, and our speech language pathology team will make sure that we connect with the clinician and um, provide treatment recommendations and education about primary progressive aphasia. Um, and we also have a running list of referrals that we have um, referred other patients to um, with clinicians that we have already interacted with and uh, feel confident um, in the referral. We usually recommend eight to 10 sessions um, in the beginning and then check-in sessions. What I mean by that is um, if the, the progression has changed over time, you, you may need alternative strategies that are no longer working um, strategies that worked previously, but now need to be changed a little bit. So then um, the patient and the caregiver would go into the office with the clinician and have some check-in sessions. And I, like I said earlier, family and conversational partners and loved ones, anyone who can, who really communicates with the patient often, it's really important that you join the session so you can also adapt your communication to be able to help your loved one when they're struggling. So here's a list of some speech and language therapy compensatory strategies that I re would recommend um, based on the impairments of your loved one. Assistive technology, such as a communication notebook, can be really helpful, especially if your loved one has difficulty with articulation or pronouncing words, or even really finding words. Um, so this picture um, on this slide is an example of a physical communication book and a speech language pathologist can help organize one. So what happens is the patient will practice using a communication book to point to the, to the pictures that they want to communicate about. So instead of finding language to communicate about something, it's much easier to, to point to a picture. So it'll be a personalized book to them Again, the speech language pathologist can help organize it. 
And how will it work? It will be, for instance, categories. Um, so maybe family members, rooms of the house, um, favorite food, favorite restaurants, um, doctors, anything or hobbies, anything that's personalized to the patient and that's easy to go through the book and find the picture that they are trying to um, express something about. Like I said earlier, drawing gestures and writing can be very helpful in communication, um, especially when words are hard to pronounce. Structured yes, no questions from the caregivers can be helpful because instead of the patient responding in an open-ended way, they can just say yes or no and elaborate when they want to. PAL or PAL is a um, strategy that we use for word finding difficulties. So instead of your loved one trying to find the exact word that they wanna say, and they may get frustrated or anxious and um, even stressed. And sometimes when you're frustrated or anxious, it's even harder to find the word that you want. So really get in, getting in the habit of talking around the word. So let's say they want to, co to communicate the word grapes, but they can't find the word. They could say something like it's found in the market they are round, green, purple, and it's something you eat. And what the clinician does is they really practice with the patient as well as the caregiver and getting the habit to, to speaking like that. So that way the message comes across even if it's not the perfect way to do it and it's kind of a roundabout way. But again, it allows the patient to at least express what they want to say. Um, environment, environmental modification strategies are important. Um, internal and external distractions are not always very helpful when you're trying to communicate. Internal distractions being things like fatigue, frustration, anxiety, and stress, and external distractions being things like things you see, smell, hear. And so it's really important to get in the habit of identifying those distractions and Limiting, whenever, limiting them whenever possible. So um, for instance, face-to-face -face interactions without distractions are a great way to practice what you're learning in speech and language um, therapy at home. So you sit down at a table, you're face-to-face -face and having a conversation that's you know not frustrating, not stressful, um, relaxed, and you kind of dedicate that time to practice communicating with each other. Um, so these are all examples of compensatory strategies. There are some impairment focused treatment strategies. Um, and it's important to know that these ones are really focused on the very mild stages of the disease. So there's something called semantic feature analysis. And really that is thinking about the semantic features of words, for instance, what it looks like, what it's used for. Um, in the, the focus is really to remember, relearn words that the person may have forgotten. Um, and it's really for personalized words to the person. So words that they would use often, but that they have trouble remembering. And really thinking about the semantic features of the words can sometimes help the person remember them. But again, that is for very mild patients. Um, after the mild stages, it's really helpful to focus on the compensation compensatory strategies that I um, went over. Script training is a, an impairment focused treatment that is for the non-fluent uh, PPA patients. So patients that have difficulty with uh, articulation or pronouncing words. And what happens in this training is the clinician will sit down with the patient and they'll write a script together. And the script will be something that they may say on a daily basis. Um, so if you're a hairdresser <clears throat> and you want to, um, and you're talking to your client and you kind of have a similar conversation with each client, you'll write the script together and um, in a way that's a little bit more simple than it normally would be perhaps. And then uh, the clinician and the patient go over together articulating those specific words together. And research has shown that that can be somewhat helpful in knowing that's in articulating that script later. Um, again, that is for patients in the very mild stages. 
Um, in addition to speech and language therapy, speech language pathologists also do something called cognitive rehab therapy. So especially in the later stages of PPA, um, there can be impairments outside of language, unfortunately. So impairments, for instance, could be in memory or executive functioning. And so cognitive rehab therapy really focuses on uh, strategies to help um, in those areas. So for instance, creating a structured routine and schedule can be very helpful. So instead of the patient um, relying on remembering what they're supposed to do in the day, creating a routine schedule and routine and use of memory aids like a whiteboard saying what is supposed to be done during that day can be really helpful. And again, reducing frustration and anxiety for not remembering what they are supposed to do, but also allowing them to participate in, in daily life in a more independent way. Um, a clinician can also help with prioritizing to-do lists that can sometimes be um, a difficult challenge. Um, as well as breaking down tasks into smaller steps. Um, so it's less overwhelming and allows um, a patient to be more successful in executive, executing um, tasks that they normally maybe not would not be able to do if they didn't have these strategies to break down these tasks um, and prioritize the things that they, they need to do. Um, addressing components of memory can be helpful. Um, uh, it's really important, for instance, that you attend to the thing that you want to remember before, um, if you expect to remember it. So things like distractions, like the internal and external distractions can prevent you from attending to something you want to remember. So really going over the components of memory can sometimes be helpful. And again, I talked about reducing internal and external distractions before. Some strategies in the severe stage um, are helpful to talk about. Our clinic is, is good at uh, pinpointing where in the disease um, your loved one may be. It's sometimes difficult to really understand how much, for instance, your loved one is comprehending um, or where in the trajectory they are. So um, once you speak with us and we can get a better idea of what they're understanding, and how well they can express themselves and what are their strengths and weaknesses. Um, there are ways to communicate and connect with your loved one, even in the, even in the severe stages. So for instance, um, things like facial expression, tone, body language are all really important in connecting with your loved one, even if words are difficult. Um, feelings first and spending five to save 20. It's really about focusing on the emotions of the, the loved one as well as yourself. So maybe you want to sit near your loved one and smile and be calm and talk about some memories that you share together or experience and listen to music that you both enjoy um, because that can really lead to confidence in your interactions and calmness and really make your day go a lot more smoothly than um, if you are having a hard time understanding what their triggers are or something like that. So um, we are more than happy to work with you to um, provide support and strategies and recommendations um, and help you understand where your loved one is at. And um, if there is a rapid change for, an, for any reason, it's um, we are happy to meet with you um, in, in the clinic and figure out what's going on and if there's any reason for concern. Some eating and swallowing issues can be part of this disorder. It's not always the case, but um, for instance, in the non-fluent PPA, subtype, there can sometimes be some motor control difficulties with swallowing. So if, you're, if your loved one has any difficulty with drinking or eating or is coughing a lot after eating, please reach out to the speech and language team and we'll, we will be uh, more than happy to help with that. Um, some other reasons for eating and swallowing issues could be changes in eating behavior, for instance, um, compulsive eating, eating too much at at once or eating too quickly, 
Um, things like small portion size and bite size can be helpful, cutting up the food and only having a certain amount of food on a plate at once to avoid that, supervising if there's any um, unsafe food around the house. Um, and then in the later stages, apathy may lead to a disinterest in eating. So not eating enough or not hydrating enough. And again, um, there are speech language pathologists that specialize in um, swallowing disorders. So we're more than happy to connect you as well as educate you about strategies that can help with that. Support in primary progressive aphasia is really important. Again, these are rare disorders. And so it's really important to us that patients and families do not feel isolated since they are so rare. We, we have both caregiver support groups as well as patient support groups. Um, we actually had a remote patient support group during COVID, which was quite successful. And during these times, it's even more important that families and patients don't feel isolated and alone. So we are here to provide education as well as support. So please feel, to, feel free to reach out anytime you need. Um, music uh, can be really helpful. We've incorporated music into our patient and caregiver support groups. Um, and community events, um, the MGH FTD unit YouTube channel. We have many videos about, for instance, communication strategies, as well as other educational videos and um, videos on you know, preparation during the course of the disease, as well as um, videos for support. And thank you for listening. Um, I hope Daisy and myself have provided information about both assessment and treatment for primary progressive aphasia.